Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dorsey Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of the American Planning Association, and I am your webcast moderator. Today is Friday, May 22nd, and we will hear the presentation Project Management for Planners. Ready to roll? Almost. Um, okay. For any of your technical questions regarding uh, the webcast, just go ahead and type those questions in the questions box located in your GoToWebinar tool panel. Uh, for your content questions related to the presentation, you can again just type those in, in the questions box and we will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. Coming up on your screen is a list of our sponsoring chapters and divisions for 2020. So thanks to all of those sponsoring APA chapters and divisions for making these webcasts possible and free to members. Today's sponsor in particular is the Florida chapter of the American Planning Association. So thanks to them for sponsoring today's webcast and getting this great session all together. Coming up next on your screen is actually a screenshot of our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. And here you'll always find a list of our upcoming webcasts that are available for registration. You just click right on the title to register. You'll see the tabs up at the top. We do have prior webcasts that uh, we have PDFs of, all of those for you to download. We do have several distance education sessions, so they're available on demand through the end of the year. Uh, 1.5 law, 1.5 ethics, and then just a 1.5 general. Um, so be sure to check those out if you need any more credits or if you're interested. Um, so be sure to check back on our webcast webpage because this is where we update all of our upcoming sessions. We're actually booked through November. We're just getting all of our information together to keep posting these sessions. So be sure and check back. Today's session has been approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing. To log those credits, just head over to planning.org, log into your MyAPA account, and then from there you can either search by today's title or the event number, which you can find here on the screen. If you didn't get a chance to write it down or you can't find it, just head over to ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast and all that information will be up there. Be sure to like us on Facebook, just type in planning webcast will pop up. That's where we post any immediate information. If we have new sessions that we just posted, if we have a cancellation or a change, that's where you'll find that info. And be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel because we record all of our sessions and post them onto the YouTube channel. We have over 300 videos, over 3000 subscribers. So please be sure to click that red button for us. Okay, that is the end of my housekeeping items. So now I am going to turn it over to my right screen to Terry Clark, who is going to kick things off for us. So Terry, I just sent you the controls and you're good to go. Great, thanks, Christine. Um, I'm gonna give a quick overview and uh, I'm going to introduce this uh, lovely lady sitting next to me first and then she's going to introduce me but I just want to make sure everybody's here for the right session project management for planners and maybe a little surprise uh, format is a little bit different um, I decided to link project managers to something that my wife Susie and I have been doing for quite a while now which is adventure motorcycling so as we got into it um, as I've done a lot of training around the country, um, I, I thought, well, you know, this is just one way. We're doing a webinar and this is just one way. So we need to spice it up a little bit. So that's what we did. We integrated a little bit of our motorcycle adventure, adventure motorcycling with the project management training content that I've done uh, around the country. So that's why we have this title here. And I'm going to introduce my wife first. Susie Clark. Yes. Um, first of all, we've been happily married, I might add, for 29 yeah. years. <laughs> we'll, we'll see if that last past our webinar. Um, but she's also, she's the mother of two boys. We have two boys um, and they better be linked into this webinar. They're gonna be in trouble. They're in their late twenties. Um, one of the things that we've talked about, Susan and I have while we've done this presentation is that we bring different things to the table, different interests, different focus of our travels. And I think that also applies to project management and the teams that you put together. Suze loves to bake. 
and cook. And she not only loves it, she's good at it. So when we've traveled, that's a, that's been one of the focuses that we've uh, tried to in, incorporate into our travels. So eating she's baked goods, eating a lot of good stuff, <laughs> she, and she's also interested in the social, the historical aspects, cultural aspects of our travel. So we try and pull that into it a lot too. She started writing in 2013, which is not very long when you when you're going to see some of where we've gone and what we've done on a motorcycle. Um, she felt like she kind of had to do that um, if she wanted to spend more time with me because I started <laughs> I started writing. Leaving me behind. <laughs> yeah, leaving her behind. So uh, she started out slowly. I mean, we just started out with short trips and then eventually overnights in Florida. And then uh, we've done out of state and out of country trips. So with that, I'm going to turn Thank it over you. to you. We're introducing Hi. each other. I'm Suze and this is my husband, Terry. and um, Terry is president and founder of Staff Connections, which is a company he started about 19 years ago. And um, he has done a lot of project management, facilitation, um, thousands of participants around the country now. And um, he's been in project management for over 35 years. We worked at the South Florida Water Management District. We worked in St. John's Water Management District, as well as your own company. Um, He's written a book, Project Management for Planners, a Practical Guide. We've done a lot of teaching sessions at the uh, different APA events around the country, as well as here in Florida. Um, and he's the father to our two boys. He started riding two-wheelers as early teens. Started doing some riding and racing um, in Michigan, outside Michigan, outside Detroit, rather, mm -hmm. northern Detroit. Um, and then took a 15-year hiatus to work and help raise our two young men. Help. 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 So <laughs> that one kind of confused me. But anyways, he's been riding a motorcycle consistently now for the last, I don't know, 10 years or so. Yeah. Um, at When we our two kids were home with very, very young. He sold his other bike, his last bike, and now purchased one again in 2012. And he's been back on the road. So. All right, we're going to get rolling here. Thank you, Suze, and uh, start the presentation. So I'm going to turn our cameras off so you don't have to look at my ugly mug through this. We'll turn it back on during question and answer. All right, um, so we have, we've gone that far. Uh, we've done the introduction here. And um, let's see if we can get the slides to move forward. This picture of us is while we were, um, you know, we're having all kinds of fun here. This was picture in, um, help me out, Sue. I think you're in Croatia. Yeah, Croatia. Outside Croatia, um, it actually can be, a lot of our travels look like that, with mountains in the background, and we're up, Terry's taking a selfie, so here we go. Okay, so just by a quick introduction, um, again, just we combine our passions. Uh, one is planning, and I've been doing a lot of planning over the years. Um, we've done project management. I've done a lot of project management, done a lot of adventure motorcycling, and then the other strong passion is my wife sitting next to me. Yeah, these, <laughs> these are your four passions. Not in necessarily rank of order. Right. Um, and then. Um, if you look at, if you think about this session today, we're going to have about an hour of slides and then we'll have about 30 minutes of Q&A, but it's really uh, focused on more of a higher level uh, overview of project management. And I try and focus on three key concepts. So if you're new to project management, I think you'll get some, some worthwhile information out of it and know where you can move from here. And if you're an experienced project manager, hopefully you'll be reminded of a few things or maybe introdu introduced to a couple of new concepts. Um, the agenda for it today, do a little introduction. We'll do some groundwork. And then these three, these five next items, which uh, are in a little bit different color, are the five major processes of project management identified by the Project Management Institute, which is really similar to the uh, American Planning Association. So the PMI, or Project Management Institute, 
is the professional organization that handles certification, and they really have established best professional practices for managing projects. So those are the five colors there, and these are the five processes over here that we'll walk through individually, and then we'll have a quick wrap up and, and have time for question and answers. So, um, Suji, you were just gonna mention that. Well, this is a picture of us. We're actually in Vienna in this particular picture. And um, Rick Steves is pictured there in the middle, the two of us. Um, we, for those of you who don't know, Rick is a really well-known European travel writer. He has a PBS show. He's got a lot of stuff on YouTube. There's a lot of blogging. Anyways, we had used his books extensively even before we started traveling by motorcycle. And so while we were in Vienna, we just exited a museum the wrong way and heard a familiar voice and there he was. So that was very exciting for us. Um, and, and Yeah, and on the left, I just have a list of, and I've used kind of a project, high level project description of our travels. And I think we have pictures uh, throughout the presentation for each of these trips. But um, you can just see there's uh, the title of it, there's the schedule. This is important for projects. You have a start and finish date. We have a duration, and in this it, I have both days and the number of miles that we travel on the motorcycle, and then a cost estimate. And you can see we travel in various different cost levels, and then the deliverable. And for us, you know, uh, the deliverable was really um, a completed, safe trip that we enjoyed. And we met new people in, in new areas, and we got home safe, relatively close to our schedule, and with a little bit of money left in the bank. So, and each of these has a little bit different focus on it. Um, so, it, it's just a quick way, quick uh, high-level overview of our projects, and a in really a project management format. Okay. All right, so I'm going to get a, I'm going to go through a couple of definitions here, um, just to establish a common language. Uh, we know what we're talking about when we talk about projects. A project really has a specific definition. It's a temporary endeavor undertaken to create a unique product or service with a definite beginning and end. And this is is the definition of a project. And this. The key points here is that it's temporary, you have a beginning and an end, um, and that you produce something unique as, as opposed to a process. So the projects are clearly defined, budgets, timelines, and you produce a deliverable. And, and secondly, then down, we have program. It's a group of projects managed in a coordinated way. And an example I like to use is that here in South Florida or in South Florida, uh, the Everglades restoration is a huge program, and that program consists of over 30 projects. Each of those projects ha is temporary. It has a beginning and an end. It produces a unique product or service, but collectively, they all are focused on restoring the Everglades. So that's the concept difference between these two. And we, we, I know, you know walking through the hallways, we use these terms a lot, but it's really important when you talk about a project that it fits this definition, as you'll see as we go through this. Another key concept from PMI is of the triple constraint, so that every project consists of time, again, remember the definition of a project, a beginning and an end, resources, and resources can be anything from hours to money to equipment, gasoline, whatever it takes in materials um, and costs, to complete the project. And then finally, the scope. And the scope is really the definition of the work that you'll accomplish to produce a deliverable. And all of these three things together define the constraints for a project. And uh, I'll refer back to this as we go through and talk about projects, but this concept is really important. And the import, one of the important things about it is that each project has a unique timeline, unique resources assigned to it, and a unique scope. So there is no one time frame, resources, or scope collectively that can be applied to all projects. Each project develops its own 
time, resources, and scope, and, and together they define both the quality and, and also the final deliverable. So again, I'm hammering that home, but it's a really key concept. Um, this picture on the right is me, and I put it in there just because <laughs> it was a successful project. Um, this was the first real adventure motorcycle trip I went on um, through Chile, Argentina, through Patagonia, all the way down to Tierra del Fuego. So when I got there, let me tell you, I wasn't that clean. I, wasn't, <laughs> I was a lot cleaner when I started, um, but it was a successful project. So what were the three things that went into that? Um, in projects, communication is the number one most important thing. And uh, it's, it carries on throughout the project. So if you're not communicating, you're not managing the project. The second is a project charter. And I've really found that, and research even supports that if you don't start a project properly, then it, it really reduces your chance of, ha of having a successful project. You gotta get out of the gates in a positive way. And the way that you'll see, I'll describe it later on, but the best way to do that is using a project charter. And then third is when you're planning, going into the guts of the project, before you start the work on it, do a work breakdown structure, and we'll talk about that as well. But if you only do three things, when you're managing a project, if you can do these three things, you'll have a fighting chance of having a successful project. This picture on the right, um, Susan told me it's a little bit hard to get the scale on that, but this was also in Patagonia, and there were times where we were not, we, we, we were out in the boonies, out in the middle of nowhere without any gas stations. So this was a tour company I rode with on this first trip, and they had called ahead and arranged in some small villages for local people to provide us with gasoline. And this, <laughs> this is the way it was provided. We'd pull up to somebody's house, they were really out in the middle of the boonies, uh, knock on the door, they recognized the guy and said, come on back, we go back in the shed, and they pull out a bunch of gallon jugs of gasoline and start filling up our bikes. But the idea there is that that was planned ahead uh, based on the, the project plan for that trip. So on the left side of the screen, uh, a common denominator, what one thing do these activities have in common? Planning, project management, adventure motorcycling, and traveling <laughs> with your significant other. They all have one thing in common, and that's risk management. <laughs> Not there, so much with me. <laughs> there is a lot of risk management. And really, particularly project management, it's really all about managing risk. The reason you do all the preparation ahead of time and you monitor and control a project is to minimize risk. You're never going to eliminate it. As with our adventure motorcycling, there's always risk associated with it. But your task, your main priority is to manage that risk in a way that it's acceptable. Uh, one more quick uh, couple of definitions here. Just what is the project manager? Again, just emphasizing and uh, uh, what, what the primary responsibility of a project manager is. 90% of a PM's time is spent on communication, or should be. And again, this is based on research. And when you talk about communication, it's not just leaning over the side of the cubicle and yelling at somebody. You're talking to your team, upper management is huge, customers, internal, external stakeholders, and for planning planners, uh, planning projects, appointed and elected officials are really important part of those internal external stakeholders. Those are critical, as we all know, in planning projects. That um, and that it, again, if you're not communicating as a project manager, you're not doing your job. And here's just another slide to emphasize that on the right, this was on the Patagonia trip. The guy in the center there. We called him Drifty because he would just kind of take off on his own. And uh, unfortunately, I followed him one time and we, we really got lost. It was not a good thing. But part of that was poor communication by the, the lead and the organizer of the trip. So this picture here is we're out in the middle of nowhere. Drifty's kind of standing there looking for <laughs> so, uh, where to go. Do we go left? Do we go right? Who's in charge here? Who's leading the pack? And, and the leader was not there. So it was poor communication, and uh, we had a, a bit of a delay there. And so the text on the left, again, is just to emphasize 
that ineffective communication is the primary contributor to project failure one third of the time and had a negative impact on project success more than half the time. So communication is huge. If you're not communicating, you're not managing. Um, okay, this is what we call the groundwork. So we're preparing, preparing for the ride. This was in a trip to Ireland that we took. And this gentleman, his name is Paul. He had Celtic Rider and it's where we ended up renting a motorcycle. Um, and he offered a lot of different services. Uh, one of them had to do with how to properly ride in a European country on the left-hand side of the road. And it was something yeah. you, Terry really wasn't keen on taking because of all of his experience. However, it turned out to be one of the best decisions ever because he not only was able to communicate, you know, by um, slideshow, but also he physically took us out onto the road and showed us where to line up in the lane, you know, making sure we're looking right but staying left the whole time and it made a huge impact on our whole trip and our um, level of risk so this was a groundwork we did and part of the groundwork early on was like sue said she kind of put her foot down and said we need to take this training and like she said i'm really glad she did because uh, not only was it, it, it just managed our risk it's it's very weird driving on the left hand side turning left and turning right from the left lane and he really helped us set up how to do that. And he also, I think we should mention that because he was a local, he yeah. knew the roads, he knew risks that wouldn't have been apparent to us as travelers. Yeah, very creative uh, expletives too. He, he really <laughs> got going once in a while with that Irish accent. It was, that was the best part of the training. Um, all right, this is um, this is talking about why do you want to be a project manager or adventure motorcyclist? This is something that turned out to be very important to me professionally and also as we went through the adventure motorcycle. Right. And it's, so this was done in August of 2016, and this was after we returned from our first big trip overseas. And um, prior to this, like I had never ridden in any kind of conditions similar to what we had encountered in the Alps. Um, and what I got out of this was such a sense of adventure and having done something, you know, putting myself out there, stretching. Um, and when we came back, we said, absolutely, we're going to do this again. And, but why? Like, what was it about it? And so for, for us, it was um, the exploring, you know, that we wanted the adventure, this um, newness, new culture, history. Health. Yep. Right. Yeah, I, I just wanted to also expand upon that just to relate it to projects as well, because um, sometimes, it, and we'll reference this a little bit later, but sometimes it helps to have this uh, written somewhere because it can sustain you during tough times. Uh, believe it or not, on travels, it gets tiring. Uh, you get wet, hot, sweaty, tired, lost. Um, and in the middle of projects, it can be very difficult too. You just don't have that energy at the beginning of the projects. You're not close to the end. Um, the end isn't quite in sight. You're kind of in this lull period. And it can really help to go back and remind yourself why you're doing this. And I think this is really important for planners too, because we sometimes lose perspective of why we're doing these projects. Why are we putting ourselves in this position? Um, and, and we're really doing it, I, I think, for good reasons, for really important values that we share, and that on projects we are producing work that's bigger than us. It can be motiv motivating to remind ourselves of this, and sometimes it can be real personal. So we, we just found this really helpful. I wanted to include this because it, it can be, as I said, um, it, it was a good discussion and it's a great team building effort with your teams, project teams as well. And it helps Susan and I kind of um, understand why we're doing this. Why do we want to do this? Um, so now we're transitioning. This is a picture. <laughs> this is a picture of me when I started riding, early after I started riding. So you can see it's not a, I, I don't have the latest equipment, I have open face helmet. Work gloves, uh, no. <laughs> work, gloves work boots, <laughs> some kind of overalls. 
Um, but I was having a blast and I was learning a lot. And you were in the dirt, so you were managing risk as well if you fell. That's right. That, no, that's right. That was a big thing. I spent years riding in the dirt where if you crash, you may get scraped up a little bit. You may get bumped around, um, but you're, it's not a life and death situation like it can be on the road. And so I learned a lot of the basics, basic skills, competencies, knowing my limits uh, and the motorcycle's limits. And this really relates to projects as well, that if you're if you're moving towards, uh, if you're considering being a project manager, or if you've been a project manager a long time, it's really important to develop and expand your skills, your skill levels and competencies. Um, this is a picture of us. We um, decided to take training. There really was no training that we could find for two upriders. That's what Pillion is is the pillion rider you saw on the first slide is the rider on the back. So it's really hard to find trainer training, motorcycle training for two people, people that ride two up. So we just did it ourselves. We went to some training and we just said, we're, we're gonna train with two up and they said, okay. So the, the idea here is that I'm jumping to the bottom bullet there. It's helpful to remember, you're not gonna start out of the gate as an experienced project manager. Just like you didn't start out the gate from school as an experienced planner. There, there just is a, a learning curve that happens. It takes at least 10 years to get 10 years of experience. And so one of the things I like to suggest to people, even if you've been doing it a while, but you want to refresh your skills, is go back and volunteer. Do volunteer project management jobs. Uh, start small with a church or scouts or neighborhood study there's all kinds of free material out there on the web um, an incredible amount of information that's available uh, i mentioned project management institute you can go to pmi.org again that's that's just a similar organization as apa is to planners and a ton of information there and if you're interested the pmp after my name is a certification of project management professional and pmi handles that process similar to the way APA handles AICP. Okay, this is a picture you can see on the left-hand side there. Um, it's a Horizons Unlimited Travelers meeting, and <clears throat> excuse me, this is I'm, I'm, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, this is kind of some of the stuff that we did before we take a trip um, as a way of learning. We're doing research um, in this particular slide on the left-hand side. It's a group that specializes in traveling all over the country as well as around the world. So it was a way to educate ourselves and get some really good insight into how we could travel, how to do it affordably, all kinds of different things. Um, some of the ways that I prepare is I follow, um, like we were going to the Alps, different Twitter feeds for um, Switzerland and Austria, for the newspapers, for tourism. Um, we also, Terry belongs to a group called Long Distance Riders, and they had some recommendations for us. Um, and then on the right-hand side, this is a book about um, the Bosnian War. And it took place, uh, many of you might remember, from 1992 to 1995. And we were gonna be in that area. and it's important to, under, to me to understand the history of the area, the culture, what we're getting ourselves into, and kind of as a way to honor the country, you know, that um, we're guests is, is kind of the philosophy that we take and to go in open-minded, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, we ended up in that, in that particular area as part of our trip there into the Balkans. Yeah, thanks, Susan. And, um, you know, shameless plug for my book, but just to, to kind of take it to the project management phase of it, the equivalent of that, um, Project Management for Planners, it's a book I really wrote because I was frustrated a little bit with planners that were really good at visioning and establishing goals and getting people together and and uh, preparing plans, but we at least it, to me at the time, this was about 20 years ago, it, it just felt like we weren't so good at, fin at 
at implementing, at completing, at focusing on the deliverables. How do we actually implement this stuff that we're planning? And, uh, and as a way to formalize project management as, uh, as it applies to even preparing comprehensive plans or land development regulations or neighborhood plans. Um, the same concept, the same methodology applies to planning projects. So that's why I wrote it. When did you write it? 2002. It 2002. Was okay. Yeah. Um, and on the right, this is from PMI. They call it the Project Management Body of Knowledge. It's really kind of the Bible for project management. Again, it's a really good resource. It's probably more than you'll ever need, but it establishes key competency areas and knowledge areas for project management, specific to project management. And uh, project management applies to pretty much, it's, it's, it can apply to a lot of different professions, not just planning. So it's a good core skill to establish and learn about. So now we're moving into what, what are the five primary processes of project management as identified by that PMI body of knowledge, the Project Management Institute body of knowledge. So what this graphic on the right relates to is we first start the project. So this is initiating. This is where we'll do the project charter. We move into planning. And this is where we get into the guts of planning the project, the work breakdown structure, and uh, the estimation of resources we're going to need, what work is going to be accomplished. And then we move into executing and monitoring at the same time. That's why we have two arrows going back and forth. We're doing the work. We're doing the work necessary to produce the deliverable. And then we're also wearing our project management hat saying, how are we doing? How are we, where are we today on our project plan compared with where are we in reality? In other words, you just measure reality against the plan and see if you need to take some actions. And then we close out the project. So that's what this represents. So we're, we're starting the project. And when you start a project, including a trip, there's some basic questions you answer. And so we're looking at how long do we have? How much money do we want to spend? Where do we want to go? Um, how are we going to get there? Are we going to fly? Are we going to drive? How are we going to get there? Are we going to rent a bike? Um, are we going to ship a bike? Uh, are we going to purchase a bike? And how will we deal with money if it's a different currency? Yeah, and that, that really related to the Balkans trip. I think we went through eight countries, eight borders, six different currencies, and it was hard to keep. Yeah. <laughs> keep all the money together. <laughs> all right. Um, so keeping with the project initiation, the main part of initiating a project is preparing a project charter. I think I mentioned that earlier, the beginning. And the uh, graphic on the right is... This is our um, Balkans trip, and it's just a real broad layout is how I look at it. Um, you know, outlining where it is we're going to go, about how many miles in this case for us, um, how does that translate into days? Um, so we had 30 days total to work with, um, and at one, you know, we've changed some of these things so that, for instance, how much time do we want to spend in any one location? One of the uh, <laughs> one of the things that's kind of interesting here is if you look at this. This was where we were flying in and out of. So that's our arrival and departure date. And this is the overall timeline we had, a duration of 30 days. So in project management terms, it's a 30-day duration of our project. And as you look here, Bucharest to Belgrade, and what we did was mapped out segments of the trip, or at least identified key points we wanted to go to. And we estimated the mileage. Now, what we call in project management, this is level of effort. So this is the number of total hour travel time that we estimated it would take to cover the 1,000 miles. So in project management, this is the billable hours, if you will, the total number of hours to, to cover those 100 miles. But on our project plan, we estimated we wanted to spend five days to accomplish those uh, 27 hours of travel time. So we, this is, again, high level. There's a whole lot of things that happens within this five-day period. But right at this point, what we're trying to do is establish a common overall framework for the project. And that's really the project charter. So on a project charter, 
on a planning project or really any other project, the purpose is a high level overview. So you can see that's what we did, a budget. We didn't put the money on here and that was a whole different spreadsheet. <laughs> um, the timeline, uh, some of the resources, and then the final deliverable. And one thing I really want to focus on, if you guys could pay attention here to the <laughs> bottom, <laughs> I, like I said, I've spent, uh, I've trained thousands of people in project management. This is the one area in my experience that people tend to minimize or overlook or not spend enough time on. Identifying and defining the final project deliverable. So for example, on a planning project, you may say, well, the final deliverable is a comprehensive plan. Everybody knows that. I don't know. To, I don't need to go into detail. We know, we know what a comp plan is, and let's just get started working. Well, do, what elements does it have? Do you have a financial feasibility element in the comp plan? What's your low, you know, who's going to be involved in preparing the comp plan? Uh, do you, are you going to involve consultants? What's the end? What does that final product include? How much in detail are you going to go? Are you How are you going to deal with environmental issues versus financial issues? What are key issues in your community that you want to focus on? How will you know when you're done? Right? Yeah, that's a really fundamental question. How will you know when you're done with the project? And a good thing to keep in mind is you, you are not producing perfection. You're producing acceptability <laughs> that... Uh, we don't have an unlimited time and money to produce the, the perfect comprehensive plan, whatever that may look like. You have to do something that's reasonable and doable. And to do that and to get approval of that before you start the plan, uh, the project. So here's a, a picture. It's just a, a template. Charter. A charter template. And it a couple of key points I want to focus on here. Very simple information. This is the title sheet for it. And you go into more detail later on. But there's a title. It seems very simple, but a title on the project, and this is key, one project manager. You can, you can only have one PM per project. I've tried <laughs> a different way. It didn't work out well at all. There's one person in charge of the project, and that one person needs to be identified, a sponsor, and we could, I could go into more detail on this, but I won't. The other key point is this is management approval down at the bottom. And for Susan me? That's my approval. <laughs> <laughs> she gets final sign off. <laughs> She's the manager in terms of our overall charter. Does she agree on it? And that actually has been a negotiated <laughs> process over the years. And again, it applies to the charter on a project. The whole purpose of this, remember 90% of a PM's time is communication. The charter is a form of communicating because uh, I've had a ton of people say, well, I don't know how to do this. I've never done it before. And I'm not sure how much time it's going to take or what it's going to cost. I said, put something on paper. Because whatever you put on paper the first time is not going to be the final product. It's going to be revised. But imagine if you didn't do this. Imagine if you did not prepare a charter uh, ahead of time to get these things defined before you get into the guts of the project. And then that's why projects fail. So moving along, um, the charter should address why is the project being done? Who are the stakeholders? What are the primary project objectives? Uh, what will be the final product to deliver? Huge. That's uh, a lot of time and effort needs to be spent on defining that is. And again, that's a good team building uh, exercise. And then finally, the primary purpose of the charter is to get management approval to proceed. And we have personal experience on me kind of oh. <laughs> ramming through what I thought would be a great trip and sort of uh, forgetting about the charter concept. Yes, I think we get to that in the next slide. <laughs> What's the next slide? <laughs> oh, no. But... Okay. Um, but just wrapping up this slide, the primary purpose is to get management approval prior to proceeding on the project. And you don't have a project until you have an approved charter. That's a very difficult thing to do, and I know I, I know a lot of organizations don't have formal project management uh, in their organization, and so they say, well, how can I do this? My boss doesn't even know how to do it. I said, well, people can learn on both sides of that. You can learn, and then you can help your boss, and if you can turn it into his or her idea, then you've done a great job. Okay, this is a picture of us. We were taking a ferry from Northern Ireland to Scotland. And um, what was important 
Help me here, honey, because we were. Well, this was, was this was one of those things when you're initiating or you're establishing on a charter, for example, we needed to figure this out ahead of time. This was one of those things that was critical to our project. And we needed to say if we wanted to go from, if we wanted to rent the wow. bike in, Scot in Ireland and then also go to Scotland, <laughs> there's a little water in between. We needed right. to figure out how to cross that, as opposed to going to Scotland and rent a bike. But we wanted to do the whole thing. So this is some of, right, some of the initial background we looked at in order to get from one place to another. Yeah, and it was really a key point. I mean, this was a major milestone in the project. And, and it was something if we hadn't really considered ahead of time, it could have really thrown us for a loop in completing our project, completing our trip. <laughs> Okay, Christine, we have a quick survey here. Let me just uh, introduce this uh, survey very quickly and I'll turn it over to you, Christine. Um, again, I'm really uh, focusing, I wanna spend some time on defining a project deliverable. And think of a project deliverable as being a product, a final product or deliverable, and that you're producing an output, not an outcome. And that distinction is really important in planning projects. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Christine. Okay, great. So I went ahead and launched that poll and it, I hope it's all right with you. It looks like two of yours ended up being combined into one. So I hope that <laughs> that's okay. Um, apparently our poll only wanted so many oh, responses. Okay. Um, so folks, go ahead. Uh, you can check, I guess, all that apply and um, We'll just give it a few more minutes for everyone to uh, get a vote in. Yeah, and just by way of the picture here, um, this was a picture of me on, in Patagonia, and those are the Andes behind me. And uh, that was a good deliverable. That was a nice <laughs> part of the trip. <laughs> we'll give it another second here. Okay. 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 I think that people are really thinking about this. <laughs> Yeah, it's not easy. It really is not easy to try and distinguish between outputs and outcomes and, and uh, what is our final deliverable? What is it we're talking about? Okay, so it looks like some people, for some reason, don't have the ability to take the poll. Um, okay. I hear you. I see all of these comments coming in. Um, it's okay. <laughs> um, we're, we're gonna go over the responses. Now, I'm not, I'm not sure why some folks aren't able to. So I'm gonna go ahead and close it, and then I'm gonna share the results. Can you see these, Terry? Can you see the results? Um, nope, I can't okay. see them. All right, so then I'll tell you. Um, okay. So it looks like 88% say new zoning ordinance, 32% say safe streets, better playground lighting, 86% say parking standards document, 22% increased affordable housing, 46% fun, safe, time sensitive, and affordable trip. All right. Um, well, so those, those are, let me hide that and get your screen back. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So just starting off the top, new zoning ordinance. I think uh, well over three quarters of you picked that one, which is great. That is a final output. That's a deliverable. That's got a beginning and an end. You know when you're going to produce it. Safe streets is not. You don't know when you have safe streets. How safe are they? What's your goals? How are you going to do that? When are you completed? Um, so that's not a deliverable. Parking standards, yes. Better playground lighting, no. What's better? How do you define it? When do you know when you're done? Increased affordable housing, no. It's not a deliverable. It's a, it's a, it's an outcome. You may do certain things to increase affordable housing, but but in terms of project management lingo, that is not a, a deliverable. And then fun, safe, time sensitive, and affordable trip. Yes, yay. Yay. All right, so hopefully that gets across the concept of deliverables. We're now moving into planning. So we're moving into planning the details of the program. I won't spend a lot of time on this. We're gonna move it along. Well, part of what this is though, is that um, Terry and I were talking earlier, Terry likes to do a lot of planning. Um, and something that he does a lot of times in our trips is, make airline reservations in the initiating phase versus the planning phase <laughs> so that's a big difference between those two you can't go back and undo that 
Yeah, and that's got me into trouble before because uh, what I've done in my mind, I know where I want to go when I want to go. So let's get the, the ticket. Let's move forward and do this. But I haven't talked that out. I, I we didn't agree with the with my project team, my decision maker on the charter. But um, just just to look at this on the left, it's a really good information sheet I found about Bosnia Herzegovina and some good information there that was relevant to it when we got into the details of our project planning. Um, key point here is this is something that if I were to combine all of the hours it took me to learn how to how to use Basecamp, which is the programming uh, tool for uh, that works with Garmin GPS, uh, it's it, hundreds of hours. But what I want to point on this, this is our map that we used. If you can see my pointer, we flew into Bucharest, rented the motorcycle, and hit. This is what we. This was our preliminary route we identified to go through Serbia. Uh, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Croatia, up into Slovenia, um, and then Italy. down into a little bit of Italy and Trieste. And this section going down the Adriatic coast. We ended uh, up changing that. Right. So the point here is it's a preliminary route, but we changed it during the project, during our trip. We changed it. And just for location, this is Italy, the Adriatic Sea, and then um, our trips through these Romania and so forth. So. Um, here's an estimate of our project budget. Actually, this was an after the fact to compare our estimates with uh, reality, but this is reality. And this is helpful too when you're doing other projects. You know, if you can get a, a budget of a similar project to apply, all the better. But this was uh, just an example of some of our travel related expenses and a way to capture that. So we did this work. Um, electronic helpers, this is for traveling. Again, I'm not going to go into all the details of this, but these are tools that we use to track, um, to, to provide uh, status reports to other people who are following us, and uh, the tools that we these use, the, tools, right? the electronic tools to help us go safe. And here's a, a one person's interpretation of that. That's a real motorcycle, probably one of our long distance rider friends. Um, and this is useful to him or her. This is good information. Him, there he is over here. Um, I don't know what all of that is, but he does, and he thinks it's useful. To me, it's overkill for me and the, the kind of trips that we go on. So keep that in mind when you're picking about um, electronic helpers for projects. Hey, don't use a sledge, sledgehammer to kill a gnat. Use what fits your projects. A lot of people use Microsoft Project. You know, on a lot of projects, I've used Microsoft Excel, just a simple spreadsheet, and uh, for identifying tasks and durations. But just some key points to keep in mind, the project management software is a tool. It's not the project. Managing the project is a lot more than managing the software. Some people get so focused on, well, I got to have the right numbers in the MS project, they forget what the team is supposed to be doing at that point in time. Use a tool to fit your needs. Remember, they're just tools and not the project. So but it is a tool to help you. And uh, we've had experiences on our trips where the tools have gone haywire and we have survived to see the end. So even if you don't have these tools, you can still manage projects. Uh, one thing to keep in mind for planning projects is that when you're planning the project, are you going to have a consultant? Are you going to have an outside person contribute to the uh, the output and the production of the deliverable. And my main point here is that on the big circle, the white circle, you have the entire project. If you're the PM, you're responsible for the entire project, part of which is work being done by a con contractor or consultant. So some people separate these two and say, well, that's all being done by the contractor. I don't need to worry about it. Well, you do if the work from the contractor is going to be contributing towards your final deliverable. And so we tend to underestimate that. So the questions on the left are things to consider about using outside resources. When contract management, put it in the WBS, uh, how are they contributing to the deliverables? And it takes time and resources to review and pay the invoices. So just a, a little reminder. Um, zipping into uh, work breakdown structure. This is the detailed work description, the project description. What always keep the deliverable in mind, 
Um, this is a, I know it seems really picky, but if you don't use a verb object format, you can't estimate duration and level of effort and uh, resources. So in this case, I have right project parking standards. If you just had parking standards, you wouldn't know what you're doing with them. Start general, become more specific, keep statements short to the point, apply consistent numbering. So let me show you what that, uh, how that plays out in the field too. Um, coming back to work breakdown structure, these are two pictures <laughs> of how two different people or two different couples approach packing. And the one on the top is a picture, it's not our bike, but that's what somebody packed on a trip on their motorcycle. And you can see there's only one room for one person. So that's a single rider going on a big adventure. We don't pack like that. No. <laughs> <laughs> but that's part of our project. Each project or trip is unique. So we've gone through a whole evolution about packing, and it usually results now in, in much less. We pack a much. lot less. And even Suze has gone, we've gone to you know, little sessions at seminars and rallies, motorcycle rallies that talk about how to pack. So um, apply that same concept to uh, work breakdown structure. Don't put it in there unless it, it's work that absolutely has to be done and you're gonna do it and need it. Scheduling public involvement. Um, did you want to talk about the picture? Well, this is briefly? some of the, yeah. This yeah. is some of the local input that we talked about. Um, this is in MoStar, actually, and um, it was in one of the little shops there. And we were just getting some. Tara was getting some input from this guy who um, was a local and was able to give us recommendations for all kinds of different things. Turns out, by talking to him, he spoke seven languages is that yeah right? six or seven languages he yeah could, he read at latin he i mean he was amazing and but it was part of just getting the to know the culture of the area which was really important and he got so comfortable with you tara that um he actually left you carrie in charge of the store for about 20 minutes <laughs> yeah, he while left, he took off <laughs> well, had lunch or something and left me with the store um but how how does this relate to projects and again when we're planning a project, we sometimes forget about scheduling public involvement. So when we've scheduled our trips, we've revised our schedules to include time for talking to locals and enjoying the scenery and so forth. It's important for you to include public involvement in your project plans. And things like we take for granted advertisements, notifications, somebody's got to write them, somebody's got to post them, meeting dates, milestones, uh, Doc, uh, document revisions are sometimes at the end of a revised document, you have a milestone that has to be reviewed by somebody, meaning public involvement. Um, so anyhow, these are important things to keep in mind when you're putting your project plan together for a planning project that a lot of us tend to either completely forget or underestimate the time and resources necessary to do it. So what? Are, how do you do a WBS? Uh, the way that I do it, it's sometimes old school. I get out sticky notes in the classroom and I say, write down a task per sticky note, stick it on a wall and start putting it in order. Um, and and people kind of freeze, but you just got to do it. Um, it's they just think it's old school. <laughs> they think it's old school until this picture on the right is from a recent edition of a Wall Street Journal and look at the bottom. Ford, en Ford engineers in Dearborn, Use sticky notes to mock up the layout of a ventilator production. So they're shifting auto production to ventilator production, and they use sticky notes as a flow chart. So it's real, it's modern, it's coming back. But it's a really good way also to work with teams and make sure you don't forget any of the work. Obviously, not going to go through the details, but this is really a work breakdown structure we did for our Alps project. Our Alps trip. <laughs> So on the left, the route that relates to segments that I put in the GPS, dates, departure arrivals, hours, miles, um, and then where we were staying and, and all kinds of reservations. Yeah, yeah. We this was our first major trip, so we really reserved all of our rooms. Everything was was set ahead of time. That's the, these were rates of the hotels and then some notes. So this is really the guts of a work breakdown structure. It's got all the components of a work breakdown structure. It just um, is related to travel. And this was done on Excel? Done on Excel, nothing fancy. So that's one example. 
And this is the way it looks, an example of uh, the text of a work WBS on the left, and what it looks like in Microsoft Project if you put it in the tasks. The column here under task name comes from your WBS, and then you put in the duration in the software, and it produces this Gantt chart. For our travels, Susie's, Susie likes to use a calendar format. This is my way. This makes it much more organized to me, to my way of thinking, but it's still all the same information. When we're leaving, when we're arriving, where we've made reservations, we've also included the number of estimated hours and miles we'll be traveling each day, and the points of interest that we want to make sure we hit. Yeah, and when our flights are. Those are important. Those are major milestones on our <laughs> projects. We don't want to miss a flight, which we've, we, done. we've done, and it's not fun. <laughs> not our fault. <laughs> but uh, another point here in terms of doing project management, it doesn't really matter what format you use. People are probably now most familiar with the Gantt chart. Well, what's wrong with a calendar like this? There's nothing wrong with this. Whatever fits the project, the needs of the project. And again, I think I did this in Word. It's just a very simple Word format. All right, so now we're doing the work. Executing phase. <laughs> <We're> been, <laughs> up until now, we've been uh, planning the project, basically, and now we're into doing the work, executing and monitoring the work. These two things happen at the same time. So you're doing, your team's doing the work, and as PM, you're kind of making sure they're on track. So we were monitoring. We saw a roadside barbecue sign and thought it would be fun, pulled <laughs> over, and that's what we got. So that's an example of monitoring. Not such a great deal. This is an example of monitoring a wonderful meal. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what happened? We're in the middle of this project. Actually, you were being generous. I saw the sign <laughs> and thought, oh, that looks interesting. Let's stop there. I really don't know what that animal we is. We think it's a goat. Let's say it's a goat. It's a goat. And the food yeah. was really not good at all. So we said, let's not do that anymore. <laughs> we're more dessert people, so we focused <laughs> on desserts. Then again, the PM, the project management concept there is follow the plan, but make revisions as you go along. Some of those involve known risks. So known risks on our travel are things like insurance, especially when we went to the Balkans, we got evacuation, emergency evacuation insurance for both injury related and also if there were some riots or uh, uh, government takeovers, we would, <laughs> Who knows? we would be escorted out of the country. Um, we don't do that for all our trips. Um, border crossings, we knew we were going to have them. Mm -hmm. We needed to talk about where's our passports, how are we going to have that available. Language was an issue. I mean, um, in Latin America, I speak a little Spanish. In the Balkans, they literally, almost every country has its own language or form of language. They have a local language and then they have acrylic uh, Cyrillic, Cyrillic <laughs> alphabet. <laughs> alphabet, which is just bizarre, and there is no way we're going to learn that. Um, but there are ways to manage known risks, if you know ahead of time. So there's a border picture. We had Google Translate in case of language, and we also discovered that with the exception of one location or one event, a meal, everybody there spoke English. Yeah, to some degree or another. Sometimes we weren't sure what we were getting, but it worked. And down here on the right, um, at GAT safety, this is kind of a goofy acronym, but it's, it means all the gear, all the time. And we really follow that rule. We're always wearing safety gear, helmets, motorcycle uh, gear uh, with uh, pads and so forth. Unknown risks happen. And this is when we were traveling through the Alps. Uh, it was cold and wet. And if you've ever been there, you know that some of the longer tunnels have heaters in them, which was wonderful, except I wear glasses and we had a, a shield on the, on the helmet. Everything fogged up. As soon as we entered the, um, the tunnel, I was blind. And I really kind of went into panic mode. I couldn't see anything except the taillights of the car in front of me. And I started yelling to Sue's, I can't see, I can't see, I can't see. And then all of a sudden I just relaxed, forced myself to relax, trust the process. I knew how to ride. I just needed to keep going forward. Stay work, between the lines. Stay <laughs> between the lines and don't overreact. Don't slam on the brakes or go too fast. Another way of managing our risk on the travel is to ride our ride. 
The lower left is a professional motorcycle racer leaning over 60 degrees. We're never going to do that. Upper left was, was a couple riding in a sidecar that went by us like we were standing still, and that's not us either. So, so we, we're riding our ride, bottom right, yep. very comfortable. And it's a way to manage risk, and you, you manage your projects the way that you manage them. All right, let's give this a shot. This is in the Alps, and part, the main message here is also enjoy the ride. Let's see how this works. Susan's on the back. So for me, this was all about enjoying the ride. And what I, this was thrilling for me. I had gone from not even liking to be on the motorcycle to taking it slowly, small trips. And now here we are. This is Stelvio, is the pass in the Alps in Italy. We were at like 8,000 feet, I think. And I was riding on the back, taking the video using both hands. So on the video, not yeah, on the bike. Uh, no, on the, <laughs> on the camera. So that was thrilling for me. Yeah. And so the take home message there is just while you're in the middle of a project, you know, just smell the roses a little bit. Sometimes it's difficult to do that. And then monitoring and controlling. Um, this is a picture of Sue's with a couple in of Romania. Of, yeah. In, in a Romania. little market. Yep. At a market. And I love the shirt. The lady's shirt says party time. <laughs> but um, we've monitored and we control. So we would receive information, if you think of it in project management terms, throughout our trip and revise things as we needed necessary, needed to. So monitoring and controlling is really change management. So you collect information. If the variance is big enough between where you said you were going to be and where you are, you need to make a change. And that's the, that's the concept. Oof. <laughs> yeah, the, the, I, we still get little shakes here. This was moving into Zagreb, I think. We were pulling into Zagreb, was um, towards the little bit end of our trip. Well, well, we had just come from a very, very small town, was the picture prior to this. This is coming into a big city of Zagreb. We had to stop and I take a mental inventory of where we were, what we were doing. What you can't really tell is that on the right hand side of this intersection is a one way, on the left hand side is two ways. And there's also trams running back and forth between them, and we needed to go to the right. Right, and we didn't, if we hadn't stopped and monitored, we wouldn't have changed our behavior. We wouldn't have been aware of some obstacles. So again, on the left, we're just constantly communicating. We used the Bluetooth intercom to communicate between our helmets. And- uh, Jerry's I, colorblind. I'm so colorblind, so she- I always watch out for stop signs <laughs> and signals and that kind of thing. And we're always monitoring our fatigue and dehydration. You actually do get dehydrated. So it was a good thing that we monitored this situation ahead of time. Let's see how this video plays. Because this is what... That's where we ended up. This is a... The street we turned left. Yeah. So I don't know if you can hear me on this. So the, the, if we hadn't monitored ahead of time, that would have been a really rude <laughs> awakening for me riding the motorcycle if I hadn't known that that's what we were getting into and I was prepared for it. Um, project detours, project change. Again, it's uh, change management. It's about monitoring and controlling. This is, um, we were in Montenegro and we, had, we were heading to the top of a mountain for lunch. And all of a sudden, we ran into unexpected construction, didn't show up on any maps, GPS, nothing like that. Um, there were no warning signs. There was no construction traffic ahead signs. Nobody had a hard hat on. Um, no one was directing traffic, like I said. And it was totally heavy construction, I mean, dump trucks. And they didn't even look at us when we drove by. So this is after we made it through. You know? yeah, it, it was so shaky that she, you know, she didn't want to take a picture. I mean, we were dodging, moving earth movers and, and yeah. uh yeah, dump trucks and major boulders and things. So um, a lot of a lot of times you'll have projects. You need to change the projects while you're in the middle of it, and our change and decide: do you want to keep going or do you want to turn around and revise the plan? And in this case, we kept going, and it turned out okay. But there have been other times where we have turned around, and it 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 wasn't the right direction to go, and we needed to revise our plan. Same concept in project management. Uh, project reporting, this is part of uh, projects, and on the left we have a blog. If anybody's interested, we've tried to capture all of our trips there. And I try and do a daily blog now at the evening, 
and it's a good status report. Our, uh, our two boys like to make sure we're still breathing <laughs> and maybe where we are, what we're doing. Um, but the same idea report uh, relates to projects in that uh, project reporting, remember communication, is a huge part of all projects. And there are a lot of different ways to report projects. Red, yellow, green is one of them. If you're not colorblind. Uh, but there are a lot of ways to get, provide quick status reports on projects, and that's a responsibility of the PM. So now we're closing. We knew we were home. <laughs> <laughs> we knew we were home when, Philadelphia. We saw, <laughs> when we saw the fire hydrant in the Philadelphia airport. Um, we're closing the project. And on a project, this is where you have produced the deliverable, and then you kind of say, um, you do a walkthrough. Did we do what we said we were going to do? Not did we produce the perfect plan, but did we do what we said we were going to do in the um, charter? This is a picture of the Bay of Kotor in Montenegro. It was our last big stop, and it I think the picture answers the question for us. Uh, absolutely gorgeous, and we were able to stay there for a few days. So we had a good trip, and the deliverable was acceptable. We had to get back, but uh, everything went well on that trip. And, I, and another key point I want to make is perfection is not an option. We talked about that. Another thing with planning projects, packaging is important and a public celebration. That's all after the deliverable has been produced. And then one other thing just quickly um, is that we have lessons learned on projects after they've been completed. And what will we do different? What yeah. will we change? A lot of times when we get home, we kind of, as I'm unpacking, I'm make a note of what didn't get used or what I would like to have had with me and just make records of those. And then just a summary, quick summary. This is a picture out of our plane uh, on flying home, full moon reflected off the airplane's wing. But just a quick summary of the key points we talked about here. Prepare, review, values and goals because at times you're gonna need them. And then the major five components of uh, processes of project management and to remember to enjoy the ride. And there we go. We're at questions, answers. Uh, there's our contact information, email, phone, um, company's website is there if you want to check it out. I'll turn it over to you, Christine, see what kind of questions we have. Great. So just a couple of reminders. Uh, first, we are recording this session and it will be available on our YouTube channel. Just search Planning Webcast. And we will also have a PDF available for you to download on our webcast webpage, which is ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. Okay, so, and folks, if you do have questions, just type them into that uh, chat box that you have in your GoToWebinar tool panel. Okay, let's get going here. Um, the first question that came through, um, your book has a couple editions. How how much do they differ? There are, there are actually two questions about that, that they have, uh, an older version and want to know uh, what's different between between them? Well, the only difference I know is there's a hardcover version and there's a soft cover. I have not made any updates or revisions to it, so probably what you have is the only version that's out there. So there are uh, there haven't been any updates or revisions. So okay. if you got it, that's the right one. Great. Um, next question. Is there a role in the project charter for values or principles? So, for example, uh, including things like diversity, representation, transparency, is there a place for that in the project charter? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's a great question. And again, it comes back to the idea that every project, there we go, every project is unique. And things like diversity and uh, equity issues are really important to, to establish in the charter phase so that you know um, that, well, not only you as the project manager, but that, um, I'm sorry, I got a little distracted there. Not only that, but remember at the charter phase, you're asking for management approval. And you want to let them know that's going to be a driving goal for your project. So, yes, absolutely. I would put it right out there. And if you know any um, adv advocacy groups, nonprofit organizations that you would want to be included in that planning process, I'd put them down. But, yes, good question. Thanks. 
Okay, next one. We're full of good questions here today. Right. Okay, um, if you have to make changes during the course of your project, which I'm sure happens 100% of the time, uh, do you go back and revise the charter or the, the WBS or both? Both. Or neither? <laughs> well, okay. again, let, let's just think back to uh, one of the uh, slides we talked about earlier. Remember when we were riding up the road in the Balkans, I think it was, and it got rough and dirty and we were around construction. Things like that happen on projects. So we had to stop and think, do we want to keep going or do we need to make a change? And in that question, you've determined that you need to, if you need to make a change, is it significant enough to revise the scope, the WBS, and or the charter and you can do both or you can do none depending on that degree of variance so for example if the change is, is significant enough you may need to do both you may need to change your scope and going back to the triple constraint if you change the scope adding work it's probably going to mean that you need to add some resources or time you know they're all related um, they're all interactive in that sense. Um, and if you need the charter, change the charter, going back to step one, I would do that first, change the charter first to um, say it's a change in the definition of the deliverable. Do that first, get management approval, make sure that you have approval of that change, then move forward and replan the project according to the revised charter. So it, it's another one of those questions where the answer is really yes, no, or all the above, but it really depends on the significance of the variance. So you're you're looking at the difference between where are you today with where you said you were going to be. If it's minor, eh, you can just move forward and maybe adjust. If it's major, you may need to go back. Thanks. Another good one. Yeah, good question. Okay, I like this one. Um, as a planner and project manager, we may be working within our area of specialization, but on a type of project that we've never done before. So do you have any tips to offer on how to put together a scope without having been involved with a similar type of project before? Yeah, oh, great. That's a really good question. Let me tell you a quick story about what happened to me when I was at the Water Management District. Fairly new, I hadn't met everybody. I had been uh, given the role of project manager for a regional water supply plant in Southwest Florida. I was really happy, excited, energized, started doing the preliminary outline of the project, and all of a sudden this very quiet, weak, not weak, uh, very quiet, meek person came into my office who'd been there a long time, and he said, I understand you're, you're, you've been given a PM job for the Lower West Coast, and I said, yeah, yeah. He goes. I don't know, but you may find this helpful. And he handed me a Lower West Coast water supply plan <laughs> draft. So one of my suggestions is scour the universe and see, you don't, you may not have to recreate the wheel. You may think uh, you're not familiar with it, but you're not gonna be an expert on, every, on everything. But the, there are experts out there. And I've even tapped people outside of my organization and ask them to do me favors, to help me understand a project. I haven't paid them. It, that's a really good benefit of being a, an active member of the American Planning Association and active in your section. Is I'm giving a plug here, but it, I've really found it to be helpful because you can meet people who obviously, you know, they have different experiences and knowledges and you can tap them. So I would not um, worry about not being the expert on managing a project. Uh, you're never going to be the expert. You may think you are, but there's going to be somebody out there that knows more. And if you remember the values we talked about, part of that is the humility of realizing you don't know everything. And that can minimize risk if you're able to ask for help at, and people are willing to help. Um, but it's good to know the, the competencies of project management. If you're are managing the project, you need to know how to manage a project. You may not know the uh, detail, details of the final deliverable, 
but um, you can produce that, your team can produce that deliverable. You don't need to be the expert on that. And I guess we have a lot of questions, but I could talk about that a little <laughs> while longer because it's a really good question. And it's one that I have found has helped me through my career and moved into areas of interest, but not necessarily <laughs> uh, skills uh, at the time, but I've developed them over time. Thanks. So somewhat related, what are, in your opinion, the best metrics to use to gauge the level of success of the project? Yeah, good point. Good question. I'm going to answer that in a couple of different ways. So I'm going to take it kind of big picture first in the sense that um, a success is defined by meeting the definition of your project deliverable in the charter. If you've met all the requirements of the deliverable as you outlined at the beginning, then that's a successful project. Now, the reality of it is maybe people aren't real happy with it, or maybe that's not produced what they thought you were going to produce or is going to be something a little bit different. Well, you can always say, great, I can make these changes, but I'm going to need to have some more time and resources to revise it. But bring it back. Um, don't make excuses. Say, um, I produced what we agreed we were going to produce. Um, if you want something different, I'll be happy to do it, but, but I wasn't asked to do that. Now, the other way I wanted, um, I wasn't sure if the question related to the monitoring and controlling of the project. In other words, it comes back to that. What's the variance? What's the difference? Are we being successful in the execution of the project and a real simple metric that I use is um, of course now my mind went blank it's a level of effort and um, percent complete so when you've identified a task or uh, a level a piece of work that needs to be done it sometimes isn't helpful to just walk down the hallway and say how you doing because um, everybody's going to tell you they're doing fine and then go back and update their resume. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you need to ask a specific question. And the specific question is, what, what is your percent complete of, of your assignment? And what you're asking them is out of 100% of doing that complete assignment, where are you? From zero to 100 and, and again, you, it, it's a really helpful metric to, to get a gauge because then you kind of put them on the spot a little bit. Another uh, fallacy is you don't, you don't always want to ask how much money have you spent as your primary metric. And by that, I mean I've worked on projects, and I'm sure a lot of you have, where it involves land acquisition. And so you may have, um, I don't know, a $100 million budget on a big project but 900 uh, and 90 million dollars is uh, for land acquisition. And that occurs early on in the project. So maybe you're 10% in the project and you're 90% complete of the budget, but you're only 10% complete on your uh, percent complete of the work. And people will be going crazy if they look at that only on the financial aspect metric. So you may be perfectly on schedule, and that's just, that's just the way uh, the project is planned to go. So metrics are really important, but at the completion, uh, the, the main metric of the final deliverable is, did you produce what you said you were gonna produce? Thanks. Great, okay. So let's talk about um, resource management, um, specifically people that we, um, are managing for a project, but don't normally directly report to us. Um, so how, how do we communicate with them? How do we, you know, make sure that everything is in line? And the same goes for managing people that have very different work styles. Um, how do we, how do we negotiate all that? Yeah, no, another really good question. And a lot of times when I, uh, in the classroom, if I have more time, we get into this in more detail, but really what you're talking about 
and the way that projects are managed and staffed is usually a project manager is in one segment or one piece of the organization, let's say planning department. And if you're doing a comp plan, you may have the budget people, you may have public works involved, you may have parks and rec department involved, depending on the project. So you're a project manager with a team that consists of people distributed through the organization. And we call that a matrix management. The PM's in one uh, silo, and on several of the team members are distributed in other silos. So this is really, again, based on experience and gray hair and scars, do not go to the people <laughs> first that are gonna be doing the work. Do a charter, and in the charter identify, uh, the best way to do it is identify generic resources. I'm gonna need, uh, I'm going to need a public works staff member that's familiar with routing utilities. Don't put names on there. <laughs> and don't talk to the person. Yikes, that's really bad. Talk to the manager. Or have, you know, uh, recognize that issue with your manager when you're talking about your charter and ask them to go talk to the manager of the other department. Uh, again, it's it can you can avoid a lot of heartburn and, and um, and the reason why I don't want you to, or I don't recommend that you talk to the staff member uh, individually, is that they may get all excited and start talking in the hallway. Hey, you know, um, Billy asked me to work on this. I've always wanted to do this work. I'm really excited <laughs> to do the work. And all of a sudden their boss walks by and says, what? I, I got you working full time on this other project. And, and that doesn't work out well. So another reason to reinforce the charter and in there identify staff members from other uh, departments and and make sure your manager is aware of that and ask for their advice on on how to negotiate that um, there's another part of that question I think that maybe I didn't did I answer that Paul uh, different work styles oh 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 yeah that's always fun too and, and again I'm um, I can administer the Myers-Briggs, and I know there are a lot of people maybe rolling their eyes right now on Myers-Briggs, but I use it more as a communication tool, a way to talk about differences and preferences, and we all have our own preferences and ways of communicating, ways of interacting, and I really like using that tool. I've used a, an abbreviated version of it or just some exercises, but under the, the main message for that is to understand your own preferences and sometimes we need to move out of those to flex into the what's needed by the individual or the group. And, and um, sometimes other people need to do the same. But uh, I think understanding yourself better as a project manager and, and understanding that not everybody interprets the world the same way that you do and that you both, nobody's wrong. Um, and try not to take it personally because uh, if they're going to produce work for you, they may, they like, uh, that sometimes gets into a difficulty if you have, for example, full time paid staff members of an organization, but then maybe your staff's been augmented, augmented by contract workers. And you may go into work some morning and you have a regular schedule or go into the Zoom meeting and a regular schedule. And the contractor's not there, and you think, well, where are they? They're not doing the work. And they could have been up all night uh, doing the work. Um, so uh, don't make assumptions and, and make sure that um, you understand yourself. That, that's what I found helpful. It alleviates a lot of brief, uh, grief on a lot of different fronts. <laughs> <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> what else? Like, got any other questions? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, I think we have time for probably one more. Um, okay. And uh, just rolling through and see which one might be. Okay, here we go. So in the age of COVID, how do we, how do we deal with project management, particularly when some of those folks that are working on it, they might be at home, they might be, you know, staggering at work. Mm -hmm. um, how, how do you how do you manage during yeah. just volatility? Yeah, 
Well, I'm going to fall back on communication again. And in a distributed workforce or virtual teams or whatever you want to call them, people are going to be spread out geographically. And I've managed teams like that. And, and part of those teams I've managed have been agency staff along with contractors and consultants and done it all remotely. So it can be done. Um, one thing that I think is really helpful is to clearly identify the work product those individuals need to produce. Focus on what do they need to produce, not how much time they are or where they are or when they're available or when they're not available. And then that sometimes requires more time on your part to clearly define what they are expected to produce. And, and then focus on that. Don't focus so much on uh, you know, the, even their availability sometimes. I mean, I mean, there are people right now that are working full-time from home. They have several kids at home, and now you're supposed to be educating your own children at home, working full time and trying to maintain a, a relationship with a significant other in some cases. I mean, come on, you can't do it. So you don't want to necessarily get into being picky manager over uh, somebody that you don't see all the time. Focus on the results. And, and again, falling back on production um, and not behavior, performance, not behavior, and relating it back to that percent complete because they're doing something for you, they're producing something, and the best question to ask, you know, what's the percent complete? How far along are you on producing that deliverable? Hope that helps. Yeah. Um, we have a couple people that uh, have decided to leave the planning field and come on your next trip with you. So- <laughs> you Come on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I'm not well, kidding. <laughs> follow our We'd blog. love it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I I think we'll go ahead and wrap up here. This was okay. a great take on uh, project management. It's bizarre and great. It, it was a great correlation. It really was. It worked. You guys, uh, it worked. Not enough, one of the reasons I did it was, you know, and and especially in this format, it's hard to get concepts to stick in people's minds. You know, if you're just putting up text. So hopefully, you know, you'll think about that dirt road <laughs> and change management. So right. that, that right. was part of the reason. Plus, it was fun. <laughs> Always fun. Yeah. Well, thank you, Terry and Susie, for joining us. And thanks to the Florida chapter of APA for hosting. Uh, again, I, I just finished posting the slide deck um, on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash webcast. And when we wrap up here, uh, I will get the session recording posted up on our YouTube channel. Just search Planning Webcast on YouTube and it will pop up. Uh, so everyone have a great weekend. We're taking next week off, but we will be back the following week for our Christine. Friday webcast. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you. You were really helpful in helping organize this and relieving a little stress on our part. You've been really good and I want to thank the, AP, the Ohio chapter of the APA. Yeah. Thank it really you. Helps to have that organization. Thank you. Thanks so end. much. Yeah, thanks. We love doing this. It's fun. <laughs> yeah. All right, everyone, have a great weekend. Have a great holiday weekend. Stay safe, and we will all talk next time. Thank you. Thank thanks. you. Bye bye.